pero por cuenta de haber cuidado tan simple We come together again on another men's Sunday dedicated to men and we want to continue the reflections that we started on the men's Sunday of January grappling with Paul's admission I suspect a reluctant admission to the Corinthian brethren commenting on the social reality and the spiritual reality in their lives, the lack of fathers. The Corinthian passage I trust was read earlier on, where at verse 16, verses 15 and 16, we lament. Even though you may have 10,000 garlands, 10,000 teachers, you do not have many fathers. And you have read for Old Testament lesson the sad and tragic commentary on the paternal, the fatherly stewardship, or lack there, the poor, the absence of fatherly stewardship in the life of what was otherwise a great priest in the nation of Israel, the priest Eli. And later on, if you read further on in 1 Samuel, you will see that every word that God spoke through that prophet who came to Eli, and also spoke to Eli through Samuel himself in his first prophetic message. When, as a little boy in the temple, he heard a voice calling, three times, thinking it was Eli in China, and the third time Eli said to him, the second time around Eli said to him, if you hear the voice again, say, speak Lord, your servant hears. The third time, the voice did come, and he did say, speak Lord, your servant hears. And God spoke to Samuel, the young boy, a prophetic word about the judgment and punishment to be visited upon Eli for the poor fatherly role that he played in the lives of his sons. And that word came to pass, just as God had spoken. You read later on in 1 Samuel, likewise, that there was an invasion by the Philistines. Eli's sons were killed in the battle. One of Eli's daughters, daughters-in-law, pregnant at the time, heavy with child, and the news of the death of her husband, Eli's son, gave birth, went into instant labor, gave birth, and named the child Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed from Israel. Eli got the news that his sons had perished, that his daughter-in-law had given birth under those circumstances to a child, naming the child Ichabod. The glory of God has departed from Israel. And the news was too much for Eli. He was sitting by the wayside on a stool, he fell from the stool, broke his neck, fulfilling exactly the words of the prophet that God had sent to him because he failed to play his role as a father. 
We reflected last time about some of the current realities, the status quo in our nation as far as men, the passive nature of our men, the absence of our men, the retreating of our men from family life, the fundamental fabric that holds society together, the large number of single parent homes, the vast extent of the father wound in our nature, and all the symptoms and the effects that arise from that statement that the Apostle Paul made, you do not have many fathers. We identify that in our nation, masculinity, the definition of maleness, revolves primarily around the man's sexual power, his sexual ability, and very closely related to that, his childbearing capacity. We looked at the, some of the words that are used to describe and define masculinity. And we identified how prevalent such a perception is in the minds of our people, both in the minds of the males and in the minds of the females. And then we made the point that we are seeking to grow our reflection on not many fathers, the state of there not being many fathers, as we intend to move to Paul's own idea of where the solution lies in spiritual family. And if we are to grow the reflection on that reality, to understand masculinity, in the mind of God, that we go to the Bible, of course, and we start our examination, we start our reflection by looking at the man, Jesus. So we start there. Jesus, the man, that Jesus was completely full of the Spirit of God. As a man, a male member of the human race. That means the modern man. We take our cue of what a real man looks like by looking at his life, and he was completely full of the Holy Spirit. He therefore displays fully the fruit of the Spirit. His life was characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. That Jesus, as a man, was very clear on his life's purpose. He refused to be distracted by other avenues and other pursuits, but his single focus was on the purpose for which he had come into the world. He lived in total and complete dependence and obedience to the will of God. And he lived to please the audience of one. Jesus understood very clearly that as a man in this world, he was not about receiving the applause, the compliment, the commendation of human beings. Whether they be family, as in biological blood relatives, or the adoring crown, welcome. <laughs> or the religious establishment, his only concern was to please his father. And on two very significant occasions in his surgery, the father affirmed him that he was doing just that. At his baptism, when the Spirit came down on him like a dog, and on the Mount of Transfiguration, on both occasions, the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son, my Son that I love, in whom I am well pleased. A kind of template, if 
you will. For fathers, what a father must do and a father must provide for his sons. The affirmation, the constant reminder that son, I am pleased with you. You are doing well. Jesus. So if we continue to examine this notion of masculinity, God's idea of a man, and for you ladies, uh, one of, not the primary takeaways, but certainly one of the takeaways for the single ladies, is to be guided as to the kind of man that you ought to aspire to have as your spouse. A biblical man. A man who resembles God's idea of a man. So we start by looking at Jesus and then we move to biblical portraits of manhood. All of which were absolutely wrapped up in Jesus. All of which come to us from the body of scripture. So let's build on this idea. That a man in God's scheme, a man who maximizes his manhood as far as the word of God is concerned. His life is going to be characterized by humility. Paul sums this up in a passage that very closely resembles Jesus' supreme demonstration of humility in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. But 3 to 5 here, but that first section of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Mirroring almost that event in the life of Jesus, in his final week, where he, having mentioned it on different occasions to his disciples, and reinforced it on different occasions, he absolutely gives it its fullest demonstration in the upper room when he washed the feet of the disciples. And what Paul does in Philippians chapter 2 is to bring a passage that runs almost like a parallel to this. So here, verses 3 to 5, we have, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And he continues between verses 6 and 11 to tell us what was the attitude that Jesus Christ had. That Jesus, being in the very form of God, the very nature and representation of God, did not consider his equality with God as something to be grasped, clutched, held onto, but set that aside and made himself of no reputation, stepping down and being willing to take on humbling himself to take on the form of a man and being found in the form and the appearance of a man he humbled himself unto death even death on a cross and was obedient and became a servant therefore God has highly exalted him and we know the rest very well and has given him the name that is above every name. That at the name Jesus, every knee must fall and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is God. Reflecting what happened in the upper room, that he was at the table as their Lord, as their master, as their rabbi, as their teacher, but he understood and like John puts it very wonderfully in, in John 13 where we find the description. John said that Jesus, knowing that he was about to return to the Father, and knowing that God had put all things under his control, 
four elements. And having loved his disciples in the world, he loved them to the very end. So he got up from the table, took on his robe, wrapped himself in a towel, and began to wash the feet of the disciples. We live in a world where men, it seems to me, and, and, and we can explore it, it seems to me that perhaps by virtue of being designated as the leader, perhaps by virtue of the greater biological strength, perhaps men more so than women struggle with the idea of being humble. Men perhaps have, have a bit more of a challenge to deal with the ego and to deal with pride and to humble themselves. Yes. But when you say that, from your observation, generally men seem to struggle more with pride than women. I, I, I think so. I mean, I haven't studied it in much detail, but just from my own observation. And, and I'm thinking that perhaps it is that the men generally have the higher sense of power, generally still earn more than women are stronger physically, would perhaps want to convince themselves that they are brighter, more intelligent. And so since you're talking about males, I'm suggesting to us that the kind of man that God has in mind is the man who understands that all of that, all of this height and loftiness and pomp and grandeur and splendor is not what defines you, but it is a, 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 a tool, a resource in your hand to serve others. And certainly within the Jamaican church space, we see ample evidence of males who are not doing very well as far as humility is concerned. The lifting of the shoulder and the attempts to create an air of superiority by the way in which you dress and the titles that you demand to be addressed by and the vehicle that you drive and, and, and your office and those things that people seem to go after within the body of Christ that demonstrate a life that is consumed by pride. Instead of taking the attitude of Christ as Paul urges here, be like Christ, have the mind of Christ, that Jesus Christ did not come and choke around his authority, but always push back at those who would want him to do it that way. From the beginning and in the temptation, when one of the temptations was to create a scene and, and make, make a stir, throw yourself down from this temple and defy gravity, excite the crowd, and draw attention to yourself. He says, no, do not tempt the Lord your God. And when his brothers and sisters were intently going to go to Jerusalem so they could try to make him king, no. My way to be exalted is to die, to go down. Just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, that's how men will be drawn to me when I die. When I lower myself in the service of God. And I'm suggesting that a real man, a man after God, 
will be a man who walks in humility. that 
it is conceived and then it develops like a fetus and then it is born and seen when it is born it grows up and when sin grows up it leads to death the cure now. forgiveness would be the third of the portraits of biblical man we spent some time talking about that not so long ago when we examined Jesus' statement that we must have faith enough to forgive you even when we are wronged by the same person seven times in a single way. Police will tell us that many of the crimes, violent crimes that are being committed to you are crimes of retribution. Somebody did something to somebody close to you or to you some time ago and you wait and plan and seek opportunities for revenge. Perhaps because of the Gibor nature of the meal, the warrior nature of the meal that God himself made us with, unforgiveness becomes even more dangerous. But very often, when a man grapples with unforgiveness and loses the battle, it ends violently. It ends deadly. We had a lecture here on Friday with Dave uh, Vito, one of the sons of our recently past, Reverend Kenneth Vito. A lawyer, he was taking us through the law in the aspects of the law in the Bible. And he took us back to Cain and Abel, the first recorded murder. How Cain could not release Abel. And so Cain developed a bad mind, what the law calls men's reality. And Cain had opportunity, Cain had motive, and Cain had opportunity. And now God calls him into court, and God is judge and juror and executioner. He calls him to give an account of the life of his brother. And what we need to spend much time on this forgiveness that it takes. A strong individual. It, it, it is a man, a central man. And Paul puts it ready at the foot of the extent to which we understand our own indebtedness to Christ Himself in our own lives. That's where he locates his argument for a, a, a call, an appeal to be a forgiving person. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So for us, we would say that it takes a strong individual, and it takes a strong man to be a man who forgives. Whether we reduce it at the level of marriage, at the level of family, at the level of the workplace, wherever we choose to locate it, a godly man must be characterized by forgiveness. You have to cultivate it, you have to develop it. For in the course of a man's life, he will be challenged seriously with grievances. And he will have to temper his warrior nature in a serious way. A man of integrity. We could argue that purity covers integrity. But I, I thought I'd keep them separate. People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. 
the writer of Proverbs says. It is a life that is free from the peace. Living a life that is single, a life that is collected, a life that is whole. Not a man who has a life by which he is known in this circle and a life in another circle that is totally different to the life by which he is known here. There are men right here in Jamaica who whose work require them to spend time in different parishes. We take a very obvious one, for example. In Kingston, where he lives, he's known as a man with a wife and children at home. In St. Anne, where he works, perhaps two weeks out of every month, he's known as a single man, a bachelor. That's that's what integrity really is. Free from the physical, it is whole. You are who you are and you are what you are wherever you go. In one of the gospel writers, the Pharisees come to Jesus with a question. The writer says, Jesus, knowing their hearts, that they were not persons of integrity. So they came to him pretending to be seeking genuine religious answers. But their motive was to trap Jesus. A man must be constantly striving for integrity. And I think you and I know that it, it, it does not take very much to successfully live double and triple and quadruple lives. The man of God will be the one who is constantly seeking to bring every facet of life into a single whole that is characterized by life lived according to the word of God. Sacrifice would be a big portrait, a picture. Again, all today we are example as in Christ. Greater love has no one than this to lead on one's life for one's ways. And part of what is lost in our society is this notion of sacrifice as, as, as a kind of defining mark of manhood. Not even in the gangs do you have it, although they kind of uh, suggest that they have it, where they come across that they will do anything, including laying down their lives to protect the God. They kind of come close to it. In the Middle Eastern culture, certainly in the Islamic faith, we see a, a, a greater resemblance of that, the notion of sacrifice. And I'm not so I'm certainly not advocating uh, suicide bombing and those kinds of things. But I, I am suggesting that our men in the Caribbean have lost the notion of sacrifice. A willingness to set self aside in the interest, in the pursuit of the betterment of the other. But a man, by definition, according to the scripture, must be one for whom sacrifice is a privilege. 
critical and fundamental principle for the moment you become a father. You, your, your entire life becomes realigned and you are now in a position where you have to see yourself as defender of your spouse, of your child, your children, to the extent that if it comes to the test, you will be willing to put yourself first in the line of fire and in the line of danger. To sacrifice self so that they will be protected. How many of our men today would, would run away and they even want to push the child or the wife forward to save his or her, his or her to save his own skin? Sacrifice. That we have become so caught up with self-preservation as the supreme value, we are lost and we are losing the principle of sacrifice. It applies to all of us, but I'm saying that for the male, as the appointed leader, as the God-appointed head of the world, as the head of the society, that we need to demonstrate a greater commitment to this idea of sacrifice. Where we are willing to give up ourselves. Paul, in one of his letters, describing himself, he says that my life is being poured out like a drink offering unto God. Again, we we don't have the image, we don't have the mental, the visual picture. For the Old Testament describes the people participating in a drink offering, where it is, it is being poured out onto the ground, symbolizing that, that our lives don't belong to us. Our lives belong to the community. And just as this water is being poured out, so too, we are willing to have our blood poured out for others. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about these things. Then. We don't talk in this way. This is the language that is being in vogue. It's all about self and self aggrandizement. It's about what is in it for you. We don't talk about suffering for the sake of Christ and suffering for the sake of, of the bride of Christ. In Hebrews, it describes the persecutions that the people were undergoing. And it says of them that they rejoiced that they would be considered counted worthy by God to suffer for him. It's not, it's not hip to talk about suffering in today's church or culture. We talk about being a money magnet and being the head and not the tail. And blessings are running down, and you are next in line for your blessing. And you will not suffer, you will not beg for bread. And it is, it is a, a beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, in, in, in good health, even as your soul prospers. And it is God's will that his children have millions and, and, and all those kinds of things. We're not talking about passages like 1 Peter, where Peter describes the suffering of the believers and suffering for the Lord. All those passages are not relevant in today's kind of church language. The notion of sacrifice. So when one suffers, it is one suffering. It is not the community suffering together and one and two and three and others are willing to say, I will set myself aside. I, I will stay without a meal this evening so that you can have a meal for the rest of the week. No, oh, it is. I, I will fill my belly and if there is anything left over, perhaps 
I will give you some crumbs. Sacrifice. As a, as a, as a mark of my spirit. The middle of the scriptures. The middle of the early church. The Paul Bowles and the Martin Luther Kings and the William Wilmer forces of this world. Men, men who understood, men who were possessed by the spirit that said, if it means my personal suffering and pain and my personal death, but for the sake of the community, for the sake of the body of Christ, I will throw myself into this. That God will be glorified. Men, men in churches today don't want their feathers to be ruffled. So I was doing the seminar yesterday evening and when setting up the status quo, the realities are there and I was trying to I said, look, what if these prayers that you are praying for God to bring lots of men into the church? What if God was to one day just decide to be mischievous and during the week he speaks to the hearts of several men from different parts of the city, rough men, and they turn up for service this month, next Sabbath, filled with tattoos and their ratchet night, night visibly displayed and, and rough looking men, and 30 such men walk into the church. Church will probably be empty. But we're praying God send us men. Where is the sacrifice? Who? Which of you as men would be willing, would, would, would be jumping hallelujah and ready to get up to work to decide for these men? And so we're exploring the, the, the reality that perhaps one in every four young person in Jamaica today has at least one tattoo. And you know what my brother said? He said, Pastor, if in certain workplaces you can't, you're not allowed to come to work, to, to work with a tattoo. Why should the church allow you to come with a tattoo? And God works a miracle. Because I was I was about to blast the man out of the church. But somehow I remained calm. So I said, so so what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that we are going to have to set up a church and say, oh, all those the tattoos, you go to that church. And who is going to go and be the pastor of that church? And I heard he said, a man with a tattoo. We are more concerned about our pet peeves and we don't want the boat to be rocked. No, but it's, it's, it's a serious thing though. As it, 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 I, I think it's a look. That is the reality. So when they get saved, are you telling me that the Holy Spirit is not going to indwell them and God is not going to call them into ministry? What are we going to do? Sooner or later, somebody with favorite tattoos is going to get saved and is going to be called by God into service. And the church in Jamaica is going to be utterly at a loss as to what to do with such a person. I said, I said, think with me, brothers. You call me here to talk about men repositioning themselves for repossession. I said, if what you want to do is just relaunch a men's fellowship so you can come and sit down in the church and, and talk or play dominoes, then that's not what I came here for. So let's think what we are talking about. Sacrifice. Love. We don't need to say much about that. Love. And my final portrait of the biblical man, where Paul summed up his solution to the Corinthian church. A man of God leaves a legacy of spiritual fathering. So we're talking solution. We see the current reality. We see the status quo. Our men are missing in action. They are absolutely passive. 
The same spirit that rested upon Adam that caused him to stand by or sit by or lie by and watch his wife being beguiled by the enemy and doing nothing about it. That same spirit that is causing our men to be sitting idle by while the society decides to gaze in front of them. And I don't know anything or anything. anything. Solution, Paul says, even if you had 10,000 gardens, with gardens in Christ, you do not have many fathers. But he goes beyond just recognizing the status quo. He says, solution, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. That's, that's the next frontier that evangelism in Jamaica needs to cross. Where through the gospel, we, the bearers of this good news, see ourselves as becoming a father to the person that we are sharing the gospel with. So am I, am I against any crusades? I've been charged with that accusation. You are against any crusades. No, I am not. Am I against gospel concerts? No, I am not. What I am against is evangelism that produces spiritual orphans. What I am against is evangelism and missions that takes a man out of his life of sin, rushes him through a so-called baptism class and then a so-called membership class and a so-called discipleship class and then throws him out into the deep and says, swim, figure it out, and then throws all these sanctimonious languages at him. And some stay and play the game. So they talk the talk and they speak the church language and they, they, they know how to dance and do the moves. And when the song is being played and the drum is going, they get in a chip and work up a sweat. And then when church is over and go home, they are stewing, as Ken Hughes says, stewing in the juices of their sensuality. I don't know what kind of magnet I seem to have developed. But more and more men, young men in churches, are finding me on WhatsApp and finding me on Facebook and finding me by email. They want to talk about their struggles with homosexuality. Men, boys, young men who grow up in church, who are on the choir, who are, are doing the dance and doing the jig. But they are grappling with something that they don't know how to deal with and there is no one in the space of their local assembly that they feel they can talk to about it. As ju just one example, just one example of the kind of spiritual orphans that exist. God is challenging men towards spiritual fathers. In the gospel, I became your father. Therefore, listen to Paul, I urge you to imitate me. That's where he would say, follow me as I follow Christ. An invitation to a journey. An invitation to Enter in beyond the mass, beyond the song, beyond the service. An invitation for iron to sharpen iron. An invitation for our males, our men of the church to become a spiritual father. He says, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, what reason? 
Because I became your spiritual father in the gospel, because I am urging you to communicate me, I send I have sent to you Timothy, my my son, whom I love. From his family, my son in whom I am well my beloved son. Who is faithful in the Lord, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Integrity. You see it? Timothy has been with me, Paul. Timothy, my son in the faith. Timothy, that I have taken on this journey. You, my Corinthian brethren, through the gospel, I have become your father. And out of that, my dear Adventure, I am sending Timothy to you. Timothy has been with me, just as the twelve had been with Christ. Timothy knows my life. Timothy travels with me. Timothy spends time with me. Timothy sees me how I live my life. And he will tell you that my life agrees is in alignment, is one with what I teach everywhere in every church. Timothy will attest that I am a man of intent. How many men in God's church in Jamaica today can make such a statement? For they have no one, they have no younger male, they have no younger Christian man who is on a journey of spiritual power, a journey of mentor, a journey of discipleship with them. They are taking no one along with them. They are not passing on anything to any other one. And it goes back to Sister Flores earlier about a false sense of security. They are not into that. Because they alone must get the glory. No other person must learn how to speak and preach and do anything like them. So they must go to the hospital and pray for the sick. They must go and visit. They must do everything. And some of them die and the work dies with them. Because there is no legacy being passed on. A spiritual man leaves a legacy of spiritual power. When we speak of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every time we say those words, we are affirming the spiritual legacy. Abraham had his encounter with God, and as a result, he passed on a spiritual legacy to his son Isaac. And Isaac passed on a spiritual legacy to his son Jacob. They were not without their flaws and their issues. But to this very day, the Jewish nation remains a Jewish nation because of the passing on of a strong spiritual legacy. If a man passes through life, a man of God passes through life, and no other male has learned and been equipped and prepared for life and for godliness as a result of his life, he would have died as an absolute failure. Dr. John Maxwell, in writing on leadership and speaking on leadership, says, Success without a successor 
is the air. Long after I shall have exited the stage, I want to know that others are there still in the journey and still in the field because of something I did positive in them. My legacy is not built when I am behind the airport. My legacy is built in the trenches. It is in the friendships that I have with you. It is in the conversations that we have. It is in the example of my life that I want to live before you. Me with all my mistakes and my flaws and my words, but my commitment to God that keeps me going, I want that to speak. It is in me taking daily on along with me. It is in what I gained from ordinary terms that I pass on spiritual legacy. And that's what I want to leave with us as brothers and men and for you ladies. That's what you look for. You want a man who will, with your support, be living a spiritual legacy. Taking others, becoming a spiritual And I don't care how many programs and how many multimedia streams and how many well trained praise and worship leaders and how many fans and AC and tiling and, and soft padded chairs and whatever else the marks of advancement and flourishing and success of any church in Jamaica is to be. Any church where the members are not discipling and being some spiritual partner and what mothers or others, you are a church whose days are numbered. You are a church that will quickly become a has been. So if we if we hear the children are downstairs, if we hear hear these little ones. In the next 15, 20, 50 years, Shalom will be something that people read about in a missionary church history book at the end of us. May that never, ever be the case. Because we are serious about the next four times. Let's go. God, you have called us to make disciples. We are not many here as men, but we hear your call to be like Jesus, to model Jesus, to be men of humility, men of forgiveness, men of sacrifice, men of love, men of purity, men of integrity. Men who do something about the fact that we don't have any fathers. Forgive us, Lord, for where we are going. May we take others and our lives on this journey. Challenge our hearts, O God, and speak to our hearts about how we can be a part of the solution in this country by reaching one more for Jesus.